Good morning, everybody. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Malachi chapter 2. We'll be covering the last verse and jumping into chapter 3. Uh, is it being the last book of the Old Testament, the Italian prophet Malachi. Just joking. Malachi, Malachi, Malachi. Um, it's funny, though. I always had a professor that called it Malachi, jokingly. And um, I'll never forget one day. Yeah, that's in Malachi. But I meant to say Malachi. Um, so it'll stick with you. Hopefully you've had a, a good weekend, and uh, we see even as we've mentioned, if somebody asks about why did this not get live stream, you can say the storm happened, and it is a negative, it is a con to technology. Um, there are many pros, but there are cons, and that's one of them. But today, um, we're going to be talking, really speaking, learning out of Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, in the beginning of chapter 3. And uh, before we get there, I just want to pray really quick. I, I don't, sometimes I like to pray after I read scriptures. Many times I like to pray before because I like to just get the nerves out of the way. It helps me. Um, so, yeah, appreciate that. And I was going to joke since I thought I was going to be live today and tell, say, tell everybody to say happy birthday to Mrs. Mrs. Mom O. So my mom's birthday is today. So I went and celebrated her with her last night. And, uh, and it's just been a busy weekend. But let's, let's get after this. Let's go. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, and Father, we are just thankful to be in your house. Father, even as I was talking with a brother yesterday about how we are celebrating Palm Sunday, and he was picking on me in a sense of preaching out of Malachi, Father, I, I think it's amazing that even out of a text such as we'll cover today, we will speak of, of the coming of Christ, and that we see this overall theme throughout Scripture of your Son, even when at times it's not clear. And Father, we just thank you that you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. We are not worthy. Father, in many ways we are wicked, and we and, and, and in saying that, Father, I ask you that you forgive us of our sins. In a sinful man, Father, I pray that you help us to lift you up. Strive to become more and more humble understand the, the gift of salvation so that one day we can stand before you and we can hear those words well done my good and faithful servant and so father i do pray for our time now i pray that you would speak through me father if i say anything mess anything up i pray that you'd help us to forget that but father that we may grow closer to you and understand you are the one we are worshiping here today we love you we thank you we praise you and it's in jesus precious and holy name we pray and give thanks so speaking today in, in, at a Malachi, I want to talk for a minute about fire. You may not have known this, but your associate pastor, that being me, is the somewhat of a pyromaniac. I actually enjoy fire. I like fireworks. I like standing by, by, by a fire. I, I like, you know, poking a fire with a stick. And, and if you know anything about me, it, it really, you see it through my life. You see the things that I got into when I was in little and and sometimes it wasn't great. Uh, when I was two, actually, and this, I guess you could say, didn't deal specifically with fire. But when I was two, my parents had this um, oven that, you know, the, the outside glass, you know, the ovens now, the outside glass doesn't get hot. Thankfully, you can touch it. It doesn't burn you. Well, this one that they owned at the time got hot. And if you touched it, it was going to burn you. And as a two-year-old little Johnny, they probably told me a million times, do not touch that. And according to my mom, because I don't remember this again, I was two, I just know we have VHSs, so I am that old, of me going around in my pull-up with a little thing on my hand and a little medicine and everything wrapped up because little Johnny was running around in the kitchen and decided to trip over his own feet like Colston, oh, anyways, and, and hit the stove and try to catch himself, and I burnt my hand really, really bad. I even have a scar, most of you, some of you know this, some of you may not, I was in the NICU for two months because I was born at two pounds, seven ounces, I was premature, I was supposed to be born July 1st, I was born April 28th, and one of the IVs actually burnt me, and I literally still have the burn mark on my arm to this day. I can think of other times, about when I was seven or eight, and we were camping out, and um, we'd made a fire, and we cooked on it, and it'd been probably five or six hours since we not cooked on it. But little Johnny, literally not as an example, decided to go over there and pick up one of the coals. Uh, 
and I burnt my hand then. And I can tell you numerous stories like that, with especially with fireworks. I love fireworks to this day. But it, I have so many stories of where I got burnt. Where they scarred me. But I also remember being in third grade, and I actually had a guy teacher in elementary school named Mr. Kerr. And he allowed us to do this really cool br project where we got to break up crayons and make them into candles. And then he, he, and he explained, you know, how the fire will make the candle and it'll be really cool and the wax and all this. And as a third grader, I'm just like, this looks cool. That's kind of what he got out of me. And he also, um, and, and again, I don't know how I remember this so well, but he also allowed us to use two crayons. He made a marble and, like, mixed the crayons inside and put it on a string so we had, like, marble necklaces. And, and man, as third graders, we were awesome. And so fire is very helpful, you know, very, fire is good. And that's what I think we must not forget, even as we look into this passage today, is that fire can be consuming. You know, you think of a forest fire, it's, 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 it's amazing, it's huge, it's burn, it burns everything in its path, it, leads, it leaves nothing behind. It's consuming. But just like that candle and just like that marble, there is a refining fire that makes things such as gold and silver more pure. And it makes things such as that crayon as an eight-year-old and that marble as an eight-year-old just look super cool. And that's what I want us to see today, is I want us to see God's refining fire that Malachi mentions here. So if you are able, I'd love for you to stand. And we're going to start in Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. And Malachi writes here in verse 17, he says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, How have we wearied him? And that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or where is the God of justice? Chapter 3, verse 1. He says, behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and in, as in the former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers and against adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner and his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. You may be seated. So again, here, as we've mentioned before, God is writing, Malachi is writing and being used by God to write to Israel, but there's so much still here that applies today. Just looking at verse 17, and, and again, I told you at every section we stop out, there's going to be this uh, kind of this, this assertion, this comment, and there's going to be a question from the people, and then God's going to answer. And, and, and we get right into it here in verse 17. We see it, it says, we see this assertion in the very beginning. It says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. God is telling them, you have wearied the words with, the, excuse me, you have wearied the Lord with your words, and they respond, how have we wearied him? They basically say, how? How have we done this? And he says, you say that those who do evil are good. And let me just stop right there and say, that's still happening today. I hear people all the time say, you know, if God is real, if God is good, if God is who he says he is, then why do good things happen to bad people? See, it's the same question, we just, we just ask it different. And then they, they, they respond at the end and they say, where is the God of justice? Or basically they put it this way, they say, they're, they're asking him, are you a God who judges? And the, the, the people were asking these things. You might say, well, you know, don't they have the right? In a way, maybe, but not really. Understand as the Israelites, they should have understood their history. They should have understood what God has brought them through. How God had brought them out of Egypt. How God had brought them at this time out of captivity and back to the promised land. One author put it this way. He said, they had rejected all intention of taking right and wrong seriously. 
See, they weren't, consi- they weren't truly concerned about God's justice. They weren't concerned about, you know, doing the right things. We, we see that from the, the previous passages that we've covered. They were concerned with, hey, how much evil can we do and get away with it? And that's not the right outlook. Another author put it way, this way, and he kept it simple. He said they, have, they lack the character of devotion. Understand this, they were not questioning God's existence. They were not questioning, in really, in a sense, his, just his goodness or his actions. They were questioning his character. I, I jotted this down as I was, as I was looking at this, and it, it made me think, you know, they were talking about sin. They were saying, basically, everyone who does evil or everyone who sins is good in the sight of the Lord, and obviously that's not true. And I think, as I, I jotted this down in my notes earlier this week, or last week, I put, sin's not something we can play with. Because just like we talked about fire in the introduction, and just like we're going to cover some fire, co- talk more about fire, understand this, sin's like fire. If you play with it, you're going to get burned. See, we can't rationalize our sinful ways just because everyone sins. It doesn't mean it's okay. The people in this time, they were offering bad offerings, they were, as we'll read about later, that, you know, next, maybe uh, next time, they, they weren't tithing. He, he attacks them on the tithe. He talks about their love. He talks about his love for them. And, and he talks about how they weren't honoring him. And so we have to remember that. Just because someone sins doesn't mean it's okay. And you might say, well, that's what we've always done. That doesn't make it right. And so I'm not trying to say we need to bash people. Just because everyone sins... Um, you know, doesn't mean it's okay. We can't, we can't just bash people. We have to, I, I do believe, especially as Pastor Shelby preached last week, we have to be compassionate. We have, or the other week, we have to have, be compassionate. We have to have love. But there also has to be accountability. And we have to hold to values and characters. See, it's great. We, let's, let's be loving and let's be compassionate. But where's the accountability? And so in saying that and speaking of this, what I want us to make sure we understand is there has to, in a sense, be a middle ground. You know, I think we want to take the pendulum and say, well, we can't show hate, so we have to love and, and be compassionate, and so we can't be accountable. And that's not it. You know, I think of it this way. I think of it as we have to have accountability. We have to tell people that, hey, just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean it's right. Things do have to change. Change is inevitable. I'll never forget, I was working security at college, and we had um, this specific part, this place kind of put out that was kind of, and it was was known to everybody, at least I thought, that, hey, if something serious happened and EMS showed up or the fire department showed up, this is where they park. Well, I was working security, and I was doing my rounds one night, and lo and behold, somebody parked there. And so I stopped them, and I was just, hey, you can't park here. you got to move. You know, this is their designated spot. If we ever need it, hopefully we don't, but you can't park there. And this was his comment. Well, I've always parked there. And I was like, well, that doesn't make it right. And I think we have to never forget that. Even as Christians, just because we've done something, if we find out that that's wrong or that it's, it's, it's a sin, especially, we have to correct it. We have to repent. That's that, why we use that word repent. We have to turn away from it. But he goes on. And he says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And so there's a lot going on here. I think there's really a big double meaning here. And, and it's specifically... I think we see that, you know, it says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, that messenger being John the Baptist. And and we don't take that just from this verse. Hopefully you understand that. Since we have the entire Bible, you know, we see that um, Luke 117, which goes back and and, and you look at this from other prophecies like Isaiah 40, chapter 3, and even in Malachi 4, 5, where it says in Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And then you get to Luke 117, and, and they say that this is John the Baptist, or he's sending John the Baptist, the one to coming in the spirit and likeness of, John, of Elijah. And so this is what it's talking about. It's talking about, about John the Baptist, and it says, clearing the way before me and the Lord, I think specifically talking about the Messiah, talking about Christ, 
whom you seek will suddenly, and that word suddenly literally means basically unannounced in a sense, um, will suddenly come to his temple. And I think it's amazing when you look at it, you know, you look at Jesus' life, where did he spend a lot of his time? In the temple. But I think also what you have here is a, is a glimpse, too, of that second coming. That one day God, that Christ is going to come back. He is going to, you know, come back, and he is going to receive his people. But I want to say this, I want to make mention of this. It says, in whom you delight. And that might, we say, you know, well, wow, they delight in him. But really, if you're, when you're reading in the text, Malachi there is using a sense of um, sarcasm there. He's saying, he's saying, he's writing to the readers, saying, he's saying, in whom you delight. Really, because by their actions, by their attitudes, they do not delight in him. They're not happy. But see, as Christians especially, the one we seek, the one whom we seek is the one we need to delight in. Not only do we need to seek God every single day, but we need to delight in Him. We need to love Him. Because as we're going to see here in a couple moments, of all the beautiful things He does for us. Because He goes on and He's in verse 2 and He says, But who can endure the day of His coming? And these are rhetorical questions. And who can stand when He appears? The answer to those questions are nobody, no one. And it says, For He is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. See, Christ is pure. It's amazing, and I thought about this this week. I put it, I jotted down. It's amazing that people were able to be around him while his earthly ministry took place. Understand, nobody can see the face of God and live. But God done something amazing and sent his son Christ, who was both fully God and fully man, as we read about in Philippians 2. And people were able to live around him. What a day that must have been. Man, the, you know, we, we have a glimpse of what the disciples were taught and the, what they've seen and what they heard. And I think, wow, what would it have been like to have been, a lot, to have been there in the, with the disciples for three years? Just, you know, taking in the knowledge, taking in the, the wisdom, taking in the actions of how they see him act and how they see him walk and how they see him speak. Jesus was a carpenter. He wasn't a lawyer. He wasn't famous. He wasn't, he wasn't a, a super studied man. Yet when you see how he speaks to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, it's really amazing. Or Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John. Or maybe John chapter 8 at the beginning. And he's talking to the, the, the hot shots there. And next thing we know, they drop all their stones and they walk away. That's Jesus. One author put it this way. He said, They could not endure his good and true teaching when he was on the earth 2,000 years ago. His coming is one in which he removes all impurity. See, he comes to purify and clean, cleanse. When we hear, when, when we read about the refiner here, it is speaking of our Lord and Savior. And we need refining. See, we don't want to be consumed. As Christians, we can praise him because we're not going to be consumed. But we do need to be refined. He, we need refining because we are corrupt. We are impure in nature and practice. Understand this. The image of God. We, are, we as Christians and we as humans, why we believe, why you should believe, why we should as Christians, if we hold to this, this is being the word of God, believe in pro-life and not pro-choice is because of our creation. Because of our creator, if I may put it that way. Because the word of God says we were, what we were made in the Imago Dei. The image of God. And this is it. The image of God is beautiful. I want you to think of this. Think of, of how you've been told or explained, and this is probably not the best illustration, of how an amazing, clean, beautiful, perfect piece of gold would be. It would be perfect. It would be beautiful. It would probably be so shiny it would be hard to look at. And when he created Adam and Eve, in a sense, they had that image of God, and that's what they looked like. But then sin took over. And so now there's us. And understand this, we are gold. We're just dirty and nasty gold. And we need to allow God to refine us. We need to allow God to change us. We need to allow God to take away our impurities and make us more pure. And let's be the gold that God's made us to be. 
See, that's what Malachi is getting at here. And it's not just an Old Testament concept. Look at, look at first, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and you've got Paul writing here. In verse 10, he says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if a man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. The fire itself will, twist, will, twist, will, excuse me, will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through the fire. See, the fire is beautiful because it's not consuming, it's refining. The fire is beautiful because it doesn't burn us up. It refines us. And as Christians, we have a job. As Christians, we have the gift of salvation. Thankfully, we can't mess that up. Because if we could, guess what? We would. But we need to either fix, fix or stick to the point, are we going to be refined and strive to be more like Christ so that our works don't get burnt up? even though our works aren't that great? Or are we not going to live for Christ and get in, in a sense, by the skin of our teeth? And, and maybe I shouldn't put it that way because, praise the Lord, if we trust in Him, we're getting in no matter what. But see, that's God. God's fire refines. It doesn't consume. You see it through Scripture. What amazed Moses about the burning bush? It was not consumed. What amazes us about the, the true life event, event of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That they were not consumed, but that their lives were refined because of their faith in Christ or in God. See, we get that, and we see that even in verse 3, that Christ makes us clean. Look at verse 3. He will sit as a smelter and as a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Christ makes us clean. He's the one who purifies us. He's the one that makes us whole. We see from this verse that he is making those pure who were not pure at, the time, at this time, and it is still the result of the coming of the Lord. See, that's the, beauty, the beautifulness of Luke chapter 2. When you read about Simeon, you read about Anna, who were they waiting on? The Savior, the Son of God, the Refiner. And God is at work. He is the one who will change our lives. We can't do it ourselves. He's the one who makes a difference. But we must allow Him to make that difference in us. We must be willing to be used we need to spend time with him, learn from him, and follow him. Instead of saying, oh, that person sinned, so it's okay. No, there's a Hebrew word for that. You ready? I'm going to teach you Hebrew today. Malarkey. Malarkey. Just because one person sins doesn't mean you should follow it and it be okay. It's not. But we got it. We got to live that way. I mean, and, and we could illustrate this all day. I don't have the time, but think, we, could, we can think of people who we've seen and their lives have been drastically changed. I'm pro I, I bet you know someone who was probably, they were a drunkard or they were a, a, a pill addict or a pothead or a crackhead or, or maybe they were a thief or maybe they were just a big liar and God changed them. We all know people that way. Understand that God changes lives because he's the refiner. And as Christians, as believers, as we sit here, you know, it stinks that YouTube went out. It stinks that, that people aren't going to see this live. But guess what? Thankfully, we can put it out later. But that doesn't matter because it shouldn't end here. We need to leave this building and disperse and tell people about Jesus. I thought about this when I was reading Acts chapter 8 this week. And I was reading Acts chapter 8. And in verse 35, it's Philip talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. And it says this. It says... 
he opened his mouth. Just If you want to turn to Acts chapter 8, if you don't, just jot it down. Acts chapter 8, verse 35. And it says this. It says, it says um, then Philip, guess what? Opened his mouth. And beginning from the scriptures, he preached Jesus. He taught Jesus. He loved Jesus. He spoke about Jesus to him. And sometimes we know what to say, even though, we're, yes, we're nervous. I get that. Yes, we're frightened. Yes, we hate rejection. I get that. But guess what? Sometimes all that person beside us needs is for us to open our mouths. And some of you are like Allie, and I'm not trying to pick on my wife. I'm just saying facts. You're shy. You're quiet. But there is someone in your life, whether they're a five-year-old, which... You guys go for it. Or they're a 25-year-old and go for it. Or they're an 85-year-old and you just need to open your mouth. And some of you don't know how to shut your mouth, so keep it open. I'm joking. (laughs) I'm just picking. But open it. Talk to them about Jesus. Show them that you love Jesus. Why? Because we see this kingdom aspect that should be in the front of our minds here in verse 4. It says, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord. Understand, I understand this is written to Israel, but understand one day we will worship God 24-7, and that's part of the beauty of heaven. Because in verse 4 he says, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. And he goes on in verse 5, and he says this. He says, Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against those who swear falsely, and against those who oppress the wage earner and his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. He said, You say I'm not a God of judgment. You say I'm a, I'm a God who won't judge. These are the people I'm going to judge. The people who are wicked and do not turn to me. But see, that's the opposite side of it. That's the flip side of it, too. Is even these wicked people can repent and turn to God. And and again, we're we're covering prophecy here. And as 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 I read this and I read about this judgment, understand that judgment will be on the unrepentant. There will be that thing when you get to Revelation and you read chapter 20 and 20... I think it's chapter 20, yeah, excuse me, verse 15. There is that great white throne. It is the judgment seat for the wicked, but there also is a bema seat. There also is a judgment seat for those who have believed. And it will be based on their faithfulness. But we see here a a wicked people, a wicked group, and and God's saying, I'm going to judge them. Why? Because they did not fear, they did not revere God. It made me think of this illustration I heard of this really big dog. And there's a guy, at least if I heard the story right, there's a guy, and he had this huge dog, he, just big old massive dog. And he was the friendliest dog in the world, unless you ran from him. And if you ran from him, he was coming for you and he was taking you down. And there was this little kid at his house, and... And he basically, the little kid was playing and got kind of excited, you know, as little kids do. And the little kid went to take off and he said, whoa, 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 wait, 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 stop. He said, he will be as nice as to you, nice to you as possible. But if you run from him, if you fear him, he's going to attack. And I think in some ways, we got to understand that, that the fear of God is beautiful. The fear of God, God's really the only one we should fear. You know, when we say, you know, only God can judge me, we should understand what that means. And man, don't run from God. Run to Him. Fear Him in in, in that way. Why? Because He is the one who judges. Malachi shows here that the justice they were seeking at the beginning of this section is the justice God brings, whether they believe it or not. But they were morally defected. One author put it this way. He said, The justice of God is questioned by the people, but the judgment of God is coming, replied God. That's basically what Malachi is saying. And he says in verse 6, he says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. 
And excuse me, I, I want to look at something else. And we talk about the judgment of God, and we talk about God's judgment. If you're taking notes, jot down Romans 14, chapter, uh, chapter, Romans chapter 14, verse 10 and through 12. And listen to first, chapter 14 real quick. But you, why do you judge your brother? Are you again? Why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. God is our judge. And I think of that, and I think of the amazing thing of what that looks like. I explain it to the teenagers this way all the time. We have a courtroom. God is our judge. We are the person standing guilty and Satan is the, is the person standing there blaming us of all our guilt. But the beautifulest thing in this picture is that right beside us is our lawyer. And that is Jesus. And as we'll probably talk about next week, at least in a little piece, is Jesus, our lawyer, defends us because he says, hey, he's forgiven. He's forgiven. She's forgiven. She's forgiven. Because I have died for their sins. And we serve the same God that Malachi served. We serve the same God the disciples served. Why? Because God says in verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. And we can apply this to our lives. O oh, you Christians, you are not consumed, but you are refined. See, God does not change. He's always the same. He's never changed and he never will change. God's character and eternal purpose do not change. We see from the beginning that their view of God had changed to this verse now where God's showing, hey, I haven't. And even though he did not, they were still lost and still confused. But this verse, I think, really shows us that we have hope. Why? Because God has not changed. And so God, what we see is God promises us, promises us justice. It's our job to wait and allow him to work things out. Why? Because he is in control of all things. Also, I think we must never forget that our hope is not in this world, but it is in God. And, all, and, and that's and all we have look, to look forward to. See, when we, I read a passage like this and I think about the kingdom and I think about heaven, I get thrilled. Why? Because God's not changed. He's not changed his love for us. He's not changed his compassion for us. He's not changed his mercy. He's not changed his grace. He's not changed heaven. Or at least, and he might have, you know, anyways, I guess getting back to that. He's not changed. It's still going to be just as beautiful as when we read about it. And so when we read this oracle, this prophecy of God's coming judgment, I think there's three things we have to see here. We have to see that we cannot justify sin. It just won't happen. You can't justify sin. And if you try out, I'm going to be the first one to tell you you're wrong. And I'm going to try to do it in the most loving way possible. But I'm going to tell you you're wrong. You can't do it. We, see, we need to see, and this is actually the title of me the message, we need to see that God is at work. I'm not at work, you're not at work. We need to be working, but we need to understand that it's God's work, not ours. And finally, we need to understand we have hope in Him. We have hope in Him. Your day may suck tomorrow. Your week may stink this week. You might have an hour sometime this week where life just stinks. And that's where you may need to take that time and just say, and just saying, you know, all oh, my hope is in Jesus. Praise God, my yesterday's gone. But trust in God, not to get rid of all your sin right now, because that's not going to happen. That is part of the refining process. If, if you hadn't caught that, that's part of the refining process. We're going to be refined. And part of that process is, is, is turning from our sin slowly. Refine, you understand, refining is a process. You know, you don't just stick in the heat and boom, it's done. But we must trust the refiner. We must trust the refiner. And catch this, be ready for this. 
And you have to trust the fire. You have to trust the fire. So next time you go through fire, don't ask what is it consuming. Ask what is it refining. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the great refiner. And Father, I want to say I'm very thankful that your fire does refine us and does not consume us. And so, Father, my prayer is today that as we go through these trials, as we go through these tribulations, Father, that, Father, that you would refine us, that you would make us more like you, make us more like Jesus. But my prayer also, Father, is that if there's anyone that hears the, hear this today, and, Father, they've not been changed, that they would come to a saving knowledge. Father, that you would use the Holy Spirit and work in their lives that they would trust in you as Lord and Savior today. Why? Because, Father, you, you hold all the hope. Father, our Lord, our, our, you are our Lord and our Savior, and our trust is in you. And so, Father, I pray that you'd help us to live changed lives. And I, I pray, Father, that as we leave here today, that we would glorify you. May you be glorified. Because you are worthy. And it's in your son's precious and holy name we pray and give thanks. Amen. I started to say that I didn't see our surprise yet, but I do. While he's coming up here, I want to remind you, I I got to talking to people that didn't notice that we were here, but should have seen on the announcements along with our missionaries at our two countries, two closed countries we're going to pray for this coming week are Bangladesh and Bhutan. For the first time, we'll see one that instead of being predominantly Muslim, is predominantly Buddhist. So if you didn't get one of these, remember, see us. We're trying to get with each family. And from the voice of the martyrs, so that you can pray for these countries. And we've got a list of our own missionaries you can pray for, too. So let me go and know if you didn't get one. Well, you know what the surprise is now. It's somebody shorter than me. A few weeks back, I read Jim's card. Let's get oh, that's right. Pick, pick one, and they'll turn you up. That's fine. I don't know. I was listening to Johnny Hunt yesterday, and, and a phone went off. And, and what was it he said, Jason? call from heaven or an important call coming in or something. We read Jim's card a few weeks back, but he wanted to come and say it to you face to face. Hello? Is it working? I can't tell. I'm on now. Anyway, thank y'all for letting me come by. I just want to say, man, I just love you all. First of all, when I leave here, it's to God be the glory. It's nothing about me. Uh, I'm going to try to get this right here in a minute. Stella, when I was in Arkansas, I appreciate you uh, doing what you did for me. I, I wrote a couple things to sound off, and I was like Ricochet Rabbit and Yosemite Sam on 30 milligrams or 60 milligrams of prednisone. And, <laughs> and she helped me write a couple articles to sound off. She had to re redo it all. Uh, you know, all I can say is to God be the glory. Um, I came here to thank you all for what you did. So many friends in here, and it's, it's, it's hard to. I can't go around and, and mention everybody, but I've got so many memories here in this church, and and I just wanted to come by and say thank y'all for what you. Um, again, it's all about God. People said you said you're pretty tough. I said, well, I slept for 33 days on a ventilator. I don't know how much how tough you got to be, and um, 
I was in the hospital 58 days, probably two weeks was longer than I needed to be, but I was there. Um, it started off with Barbara taking me to the uh, emergency room. It was about 28 degrees outside, and she had to stay in the car until about 2.30 in the morning to find out what was going to happen with me. I thought I'd just go in there and get some medicine and come back home, and that started my journey. And uh, uh, I don't know how how bad things got. Barbara said they were really bad. Her and the family would call and and they'd take the phone to me and pray. And uh, one time, a couple times, Barbara said that the, they said when Rick said, I'm on, we're going to pray, I closed my eyes. And, and subconsciously, maybe I was sick of myself, I don't know. Um, Barbara said she hoped that when I came out, I could be a a witness for Christ. And the nurse told her, she said, well, y'all been doing it for 20-some days now. We, we hear everything y'all say when you call when you call your husband. And uh, all I can say, tell her is thank you for 50 years of marriage. And, uh, I know they went through a lot of a lot of turmoil. Um, on Christmas Eve, I miss Christmas and, and New Year's. I don't, you know, I don't know what... I know it was pretty bad for them. Jeff had this hat made. You might have seen some pictures of me with a hat on. It's got COVID-19 on it, and it's got combat vet. And I, I, I assumed it was combat and the disease, but I think what he meant was a combat when I was in Vietnam. But anyway, that's why I brought this hat to show you. I got me a daily bread when I came in your church a while ago, so I got me a daily bread. Here's my mask. If I got to wear my mask, I still believe in the flag. And that's one, one of the masks that Barbara got. But again, I don't want to keep y'all. I see Bud back there. I had not got to see Bud in a long time. God bless you. He humbled me just about as, as much as this disease, this uh, COVID did when he, when he asked me to be chairman of the Deacon Board one time. And I put my head down. He said, Jim, you're not going to take it. I said, you know, God said he made Moses' mouth whenever he asked Moses to speak. And I, all I could do was, was when a godly man like that appoints you and asks you to be the chairman or put your name in for nomination, what can you do? You just have to, to say to God, be the glory. But anyway, I just want to say thank you all to everybody here. I hope to see people around. Um, One reason when, I, when we left, when, when we left Victory Baptist, I moved my membership. I think people got surprised that I did that. But we joined my son's church, and I don't think you ought to be in the church and, and have your role on some other church and not support it. And that's why I moved my membership. I'm still, to me, I'm still a charter member here at this church, and uh, my family is. Anyway, thank y'all for letting me come by. And again, I love y'all. Um, Ruth, whenever you left to go on trips, I always told you Shelby was ruthless while you were gone. So I never forgot that either. And I won't tell you the joke about the fox, the West Virginia fox they caught in the trap. God bless y'all. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I, you know, I was going to pray before I started because I wanted, and I'm limping because I hurt my foot before I ever got the COVID thing. I don't know what's wrong with my foot, but anyway. Okay, Father, we thank you for this beautiful day today. Lord, thank you for letting me come back with both feet on the ground and being able to say thank you to a people that we love very much. I told the guy at church last week, I said, what's have I told you lately that I love you? He said, yeah, last week you did. Lord, I just know what your word plainly says. That if we're your disciples if we show love one for another. And I think about Romans 10, 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, 
and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. There's no other name under heaven given among men where we might be saved. God, I thank you for letting me come back. And uh, I, I know I had one foot in the grave. I don't think the other one was there. But Barbara was convinced when they weren't giving me my medicine for Addison's disease that uh, for the 10 days that uh, I was going to be dead if, if my doctor hadn't intervened. And he did, he did call him and tell him he needs that medicine. Lord, I thank you for Dr. Again that's going to retire this coming Wednesday. A man that found my Addison's disease 35 years ago, and he's still, he's going to leave and go, go over to Wake Forest and teach. Anyway, Father, thank you for letting me come here today. I thank you for, for giving me the words to say and praying for me when I, and when I don't even know what to say. I thank you for friends and a community that, um, as I went to church today, there was Bob from the House of Hope. And I said, I'm, I'm Brent's dad. I had told him before, and, he, and, and his wife said, oh, we've been praying for you. So even today, somebody said that to me. So God is so humbling. It's been overwhelming. But I thank you for Victor Bradford's church and what it stands for here. And God, these lovely people. There's a lot of people not here now that have touched my life. And uh, I just thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.